Hey everyone, The Kill from Oxen Academy here. Today, we are going to be exploring the effects of drag force in simple physics scenarios. So what we're going to be starting off today with is an inclined plane. So let's go ahead and, and digest what this problem is telling us. So a 0.2 kilogram sits at rest on an inclined plane with no friction that is angled at, an ang that is angled at 30 degrees with respect to the horizontal. So when this 0.2 kilogram block is released from rest, it slides down the incline and it reaches a final velocity of Vf. However, there is this little caveat to this problem. Air resistance is non-negligible. And we're given that the drag force F sub D is equal to negative Bv, where B is equal to a constant of 3.0 times 10 to the negative five kilograms per second. V is the velocity, of course. And we're also given that it takes 0.6 seconds for the block to reach the bottom of the incline from the top. And we are asked to find three things. We are asked to start off finding the final velocity or the velocity of the block when it reaches the bottom of the incline, the acceleration as a function of time between 0 and 0 0.6 seconds for time, and we're also asked to find the height of the incline. So let's go ahead and figure out how we can actually find out all of these quantities. So. What we're going to do is we're going to redraw this diagram. And if we go ahead and enlarge this block and the inclined plane, we can go ahead and figure out what exactly is going on physics wise. So we know that at the top of the incline, there is a weight force acting on it. And this weight force, we know that's equal to mg. However, remember, air resistance is non-negligible. And we also know that the force of drag is equal to negative BV. So how would the force of drag point? Well, the force of drag would point this way because it slides down the incline in this direction. So since the drag force is the negative of the velocity vector times a constant, it's going to point in the opposite direction. So we get that this is equal to negative BV. Now, in order to properly maybe get like a net force equation out of this, what we need to do is we need to get mg to somehow be, well, parallel to the drag force vector. So how would we do that? Well, let's go ahead and draw some component vectors in the incline parallel perpendicular directions. So if we go ahead and do that, we get that this angle right here is equal to this angle of 30 degrees based on just similar triangles. So this component right here is mg cosine theta and this component is mg sine theta. And as you can see, this component mg sine theta is actually parallel to the incline. So let's go ahead and draw it right here. So we get mg sine theta. Oh, and I also should have clarified, this is after a little bit of time has passed because if we were at the very top of the incline, this block would technically still be at rest. So that means there would be no drag force acting on it, but there is a drag force acting on it. So this is just to digest what's going on properly. So if we go ahead and take a look at this, we can actually get a net force equation out of this, out of this diagram. So the net force is going to be equal to this force because it moves down the incline this force minus this force, which is going to be mg sine theta minus bv. And we know that net force equals mass times acceleration. So we just have ma at the very end. Now let's go ahead and plug in some quantities here. So we're not going to be writing out so many letters throughout this whole derivation here. So we know that the mass is 0 0.2 kilograms. So we get 0 0.2. Let's use 9.8 for g. 9.8. And then sine theta, and then sine theta, that's sine 30 degrees, this is actually equal to 0.5 or one half minus BV. And I'm just gonna leave B as is because B is such a long quantity to write out that it would take too much time. So let's just leave B as is. And we know that the mass is 0.2 and the acceleration is actually equal to dV dt. Now what is dV dt? Well, dV dt means the derivative of velocity with respect to time. And that's equal to acceleration by definition. It's the instantaneous rate of change of velocity. That's the derivative. So we're, good to, we're just going to make acceleration equal to dv dt. And we're going to substitute that in. Now, simplifying this out gives us 
4.9 minus, or no, sorry, I, I'm skipping a step here. Um, this is going to be equal to 0 0.98 minus BV is equal to 0.2 times DVDT. Let's isolate DVDT. So if we, by doing that, we just divide out a 0 0.2. Dividing out a 0 0.2 gives us 4.9 minus 5BV, because 1 divided by 0 0.2 is equal to 5. 4.9 minus 5BV is equal to DVDT. Now, this right here is called a separable differential equation. And our goal here is to find velocity as a function of time, or isolate V. And we need to just somehow get rid of this DVDT. So how are we going to do that? Well, let's go ahead and do some manipulation here. If we, manip if we multiply both sides by DT, we get that DT times 4.9 minus 5BV is equal to dv. Now all I have to do here is just divide both sides by 4.9 minus 5bv. This gives us dv, dt equals dv over 4.9 minus 5bv. Now we have a dt and a dv. In order to get rid of these differential expressions, we need to integrate both sides. So by doing so, we're able to knock out a dv and a dt and we'll be able to solve for v. So what we're going to do is we're going to be using definite integrals. That means we're going to have limits of integration and sort of bound these integrals from something to something. So our lower limits are going to be the initial values for both time and velocity. Our initial value for time is always going to be zero. And our initial value for velocity, since it starts from rest, is also zero. And for our upper limits, we're just going to use variable expressions. So t and v for our upper limits. So just solving out this left-hand side integral, we get that t evaluated from 0 to t. This is going to be equal to t minus 0, which is just t. And this is equal to the integral from 0 to v of dv divided by 4.9 minus 5bv. <clears throat> now, in order to solve this integral or make it into a more simple integrable form, we're going to do something called a u substitution. So if we let u equal 4.9 minus 5bv, what we need to do is we need to get this differential dv now in terms of u. So how do we do that? Well, we can just take the derivative. So du is going to be the derivative of this, which is just whatever's next to v since it's a linear expression. This is going to be negative 5b times dv. Solving for dv gives us dv is equal to negative 1 over 5b times du. So as a result, we get that t is equal to the integral from 0 to v of, or actually, no, 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 no. This is just the integral of 1 over u times negative 1 over 5b times du. This is negative 1 over 5b times the integral of 1 over u du. But what are our limits? Why did I say, oh, no, 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 uh, when I said 0 and v? Well, because those limits are not actually in terms of u, they're in terms of v still. So we need to convert these limits to be in terms of u. How do we do that? Just plug them into this u expression right here. So u initial is going to be 4.9 minus 5 times v times 0, and that works out to be 4.9. And this is taking up a lot of space, so I'm just going to go ahead and say that this is equal to 4.9 down here u initial equals 4.9, and u final is going to just be plugging in v, 4.9 minus 5bv. So we're integrating this from 4.9 to 4.9 minus 5bv, and the integral of 1 over u du is equal to ln u, evaluated from 4.9 to 4.9 minus 5bv. So just go ahead and doing some fundamental theorem of calculus, you get this is equal to ln 4.9 minus 5bv minus the natural log of 4.9. Now, there's a way to simplify this. Based, there's a logarithmic property which states that the natural log of a minus the natural log of b is equal to the natural log of a over b. This is exactly what we have here. So, t is going to be equal to negative 1 over 5b times the natural log 
of 4.9 minus 5 BV, since that's what's inside of here, this is our A, divided by our B, which is going to be 4.9. So, now all we have to do here is just some algebra, and that way we will be able to solve for V. So, multiplying both sides by negative 5B, we get negative 5BT is equal to, all this right here cancels, and we get natural log of 4.9 minus 5BV, all divided by 4.9. And now, in order to get rid of this natural log, we take e to the power of both sides, and we just get that 4.9 minus 5BV over 4.9 is equal to e to the negative 5BT. Skipping ahead, doing some algebra magic, this we get that V is going to be equal to um, 1 over 5B time, or no, this is going to be equal to 4.9 over 5B times 1 minus e to the negative 5BT. And you can go ahead and check this algebra magic that I just did. You just multiply both sides by 4.9 and then solve for 5BV and then just divide by a 5B. And yeah, so that's the velocity as a function of time. And now all we have to do, we need to find velocity final. And so what we would do is we would just plug in 0 0.6 in for time. So we get that velocity final is equal to 4.9 over 5b times 1 minus e to the negative 5b times 0 0.6. Remember, we have to plug in 3.0 times 10 to the negative 5 for b. And we get that the velocity final is equal to about 2.94 meters per second. Just doing that off of a calculator. So the final is equal to 2.94 seconds. This is just our, or 2.94 meters per second. This is our answer box or answer area over here. And yeah, so that right there is part A pretty much done. However, we still need to do part B and part C. Well, part B is actually pretty simple because we know that acceleration is the derivative of velocity with respect to time. This right here is pretty much our velocity as a function of time. So if A is equal to dV dt, a, the acceleration as a function of time is the derivative with respect to time of this stuff right here, which is 4.9 over 5b times 1 minus e to the negative 5bt. So just taking the derivative, we can go ahead and move this constant 4.9 over 5b out. And this derivative is actually really simple. All we need to do is use the derivative property that states that d over dx of e to the ax is equal to just a times e to the ax. So we just take whatever is here, this power, move it in front of the e, and then keep the power. That's pretty much all we're doing. And of course, remember the derivative with respect to time of a constant is just zero. So we get 4.9 over 5b times, getting rid of this one because it's a constant, and then moving this negative 5b into the front, that gives us 5b, these negatives cancel, remember, and we get e to the negative 5bt, just like that. These 5b's cancel, and we get that the acceleration as a function of time is equal to 4.9 e to the negative 5bt. So as you can see, this acceleration, if any of you guys were wondering why we couldn't just use a uniformly accelerated motion equation or kinematic equation, it's because the acceleration varies with respect to time. It is non-constant, so it's not a uniform acceleration. So yeah, that is the acceleration as a function of time is equal to 4.9 times e to the negative 5bt, just leaving b as is because I don't want to have to write it out. And yeah, that wraps up part b. Part c, find h. So what I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to acknowledge something real quick. So this velocity, remember velocity is a vector. This velocity points in this direction. Height is in a vertical direction. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to find the displacement along the incline first, or, or just the length of this incline because it moves from the top to the bottom. That is its displacement, the distance of the incline. And I'm going to do some trigonometri trigonometry or trigonometric identities to find what h is. So let's go ahead and do that. So how are we going to do that? Well, we know that the, we know that velocity is equal to the derivative of position. I'm gonna use s for position 
with respect to time. By acknowledging this fact, we get ds dt is equal to the velocity as a function of time. So 4.9 over 5b times 1 minus e to the negative 5b t. Now, all we have here is just another differential equation where ds is equal to 4.9 over 5b times 1 over or 1 minus e to the negative 5b t. Now, Remember, all we have to do to get rid of these differential, differential expressions, we just integrate both sides. Since this starts at zero, its displacement is zero. So we just get a zero for an, our, initial, our initial limit, our lower limit. And of course, for dt, this lower limit is going to be zero. And for our upper limit, we're just going to use a variable expression, which is s and t. So. Our position as a function of time, which is s, this is going to be equal to moving these 4.9 over 5b's out of the integral. This is going to be 4.9 over 5b times the integral from 0 to t of 1 minus e to the negative 5bt dt. And all you have to do here, just solving out this integral, gives us 4.9 over 5b. And then just taking this integral gives us t plus 1 over 5b e to the negative 5bt evaluated from t 0 to t. And just doing the fundamental theorem of calculus here, just taking this shortcut, gives us 4.9 over 5b, t plus 1 over 5b, e to the negative 5bt minus 1. And that is our position as a function of time. Yeah, that is our position as a function of time. So, what we need to do here is we need to somehow use this position function to find the distance or the length of this incline because it goes from the top to the bottom of the incline, meaning its displacement is, again, the length of the incline. And the time it takes to, re to go along that displacement is 0 0.6 seconds. So we're going to find the position at t equals 0 0.6 and I'm going to go ahead and just plug this straight away into a calculator, which I already did. This is going to be 0 0.882 meters. Now, this is not our height of the incline, our h. This is the length of the incline. However, we can do some trigonometry or trigonometric identities, trigonometry, sorry, um, to figure out what h is. Now, remember, sine of theta we know that that's equal to opposite over the hypotenuse. If we know this, then our opposite, we know that's going to be h, and our hypotenuse, it's this length s, so sine theta is going to be the height over s. And so the height is going to be, the, is going to be s times sine theta. So all we really have to do is just say that h is equal to s times sine 30 degrees, which is 1 half. And as a result, h is simply just 0 0.441 meters, approximately. And that's that. Just in these three parts, we have gone over the velocity, the acceleration, and the position, or displacement, of an object that is subject, that is subject to drag force. And this is just along an inclined plane. There are other scenarios. And for our, in fact, for our next part, we'll be looking at drag force in projectile motion. But yeah, that is Akil from Oxen Academy signing off, and I hope to see you in future videos.